Welcome everyone. My name is Christina Rambaitis Del Rio. Uh, I'm a senior adaptation and resilience Not advisor bad, at the World no. Resources Institute. Uh, oh, and I can hear the French translation for some reason. If you wouldn't mind fixing that. Um, we do have translation available for today's dialogue. Um, please uh, uh, click on the more button and you should see a button uh, for interpretation and you can select the language of your choice. Uh, Espanol, Portuguese, or Francais aussi. Um, I'm filling in for our moderator, Rebecca Shirley, who is the Director of Research, Data and Innovation at the World Resources Institute in Africa. She'll be joining shortly and, and we'll take over moderation. Um, unfortunately, there's been a, a power outage where, where she's based. But we're very excited to kick things off today, excited to have you all here. The goal of today's session is to advance locally led adaptation. Around the world, we are seeing growing recognition, recognition of the importance of locally led adaptation. And today we're gonna discuss what this looks like in practice um, and ensure that finance and decision-making processes are reaching communities on the very front lines of climate change and discussing and learning together how we can learn from existing practice, um, of which we'll hear some, some great examples, um, and how we can work together to scale support for locally led adaptation. Today's session is, is not an end in and of itself. It is part of a process of learning um, uh, and learning how to support locally led adaptation, investing in these approaches, and moving away from the status quo and top-down adaptation to a new standard of agile, equitable, and locally led adaptation. This is the first in a series of two dialogues that we'll be hosting in the lead up to COP26. Our next session, so you can mark your calendars, is on October 14th. Um, and we really hope that you will be able to stay with us to really engage in a learning discussion um, about this, this critical subject. For today's session, um, after we hear from our distinguished keynote speakers, we'll have a brief presentation on the global movement for locally led adaptation. And then we will hear from three organizations who are doing the work themselves. We'll hear what, what they're experiencing, what they're doing to deliver locally led adaptation on the ground. Throughout the program, um, you as participants have the opportunity to contribute to the discussion and pose questions. We'll have uh, the chat box available for everyone, as well as Mentimeter polls um, that we'll introduce a little bit later. Um, so our, our ambition here is to make this as, as dynamic and as much of a dialogue as, as possible. A few housekeeping notes before we kick off. Please note that this session is being recorded. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have translators in Spanish, Portuguese, and French. Um, uh, and, and please do make uh, use of that service if, if you like it, if you need it. And then finally, please keep yourselves on mute when you are not speaking, just so that we can all hear the translation and hear the, the person who is speaking. So with that, I thank you all for being here for this very critical discussion. Um, and I'm very pleased to uh, have the honor of introducing our first speaker, Hugh Davies, who is the Deputy Director in, of the UK COP26 unit. Hugh, over to you. We're, we're very excited to hear from you. We're very excited to hear from the uh, COP presidency about this important issue. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christina, and thank you to all the colleagues who have been involved in, uh, in arranging this important event. Um, it's a real pleasure to be speaking today at the third of these regional dialogues on, on locally led adaptation. Um, as Christine said, I, I'm a deputy director in, in the COP26 presidency team. I, I focus on issues of adaptation uh, and loss and damage, which we really want to give prominence to. 
Um, but over the past six years, I, I've been the deputy lead negotiator for the uh, UK. And so I'm very familiar with the, these issues. Uh, and, and like many of you know that uh, locally led um, leadership on, on adaptation is so crucial to, to making progress uh, in this area. Um, the Latin American and Caribbean region is one of rich biodiversity and, and also highly vulnerable to climate risks. Uh, last year we saw the devastation caused by multiple hurricanes, including Etta, uh, intense droughts, heavy rainfalls, heat waves and wildfires, uh, resulting in severe impacts on natural systems and, and people's lives and livelihoods. Um, and it's vital that we, as an international community, do more to adapt to these impacts and build long-term resilience. But we also know that there's a lot of action and progress already being made at the local level. Uh, and we look forward to hearing about more of the examples that are being shared today. As I say, we as a, as a climate community known for a long time that local knowledge and solutions are essential to successful adaptation and enabling inclusive locally led adaptation is a critical part of what we as a presidency are seeking to catalyze and to continue through to the African presidency at COP27 and beyond. Uh, we want to give that platform and that starting point for, for future presidencies to really take on. The principles for, for locally led adaptation provide a framework for how adaptation can be delivered more effectively. Uh, we appreciate all of your support with that. We must work together to determine how we integrate these principles into our decision making and implementation processes so that marginalised people and communities as critical agents of changes are empowered to plan for and protect their own future and that finances are accessible to those who need it most. All sectors of society, including local and national government, businesses and civil society, multilateral development banks and climate funds must work together to share knowledge and support progress at all levels. In supporting the LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience Programme, Life AR, the UK and presidency team recognise that countries and local communities are the experts in informing the decisions on how to prepare for climate change in their own context. And they should have the autonomy to make informed decisions on building their resilience. With Fiji and other partners, the UK Presidency launched the Task Force on Access to Climate Finance to align programmatic support behind national climate plans to improve local level access to financial flows. And again, we as a community all know how key that is. Um, a set of principles under the Task Force on Access to Climate Finance will be developed and published to underpin and guide the new approach before COP with climate providers encouraged to sign. We're encouraging the adaptation research community to endorse the research principles to carry out action oriented research that responds to local needs. The Adaptation Research Alliance is seeking to catalyze action oriented research, strengthening collaboration between southern led local universities and research institutions to enhance capacity building. Ahead of COP26, the UN General Assembly later this month and the Italian led pre COP in October all of these provide opportunities for highlighting the importance of locally led adaptation and the progress which is being made through donors and the international community, including the task force on access I've just mentioned, and crucially Life AR. In making locally led adaptation a central priority for the COP26 presidency, we not only want to amplify the cause for greater support for locally led action, but also address the barriers that restrict and prevent finance flowing to that local level. We want to carry momentum into the African COP27 presidency with adaptation and loss and damage a priority for developing and developed countries alike. I look forward to hearing the outputs of what I'm sure will be a rich conversation today and continuing to work together to take collective action on this crucial agenda to COP26 and beyond. Thanks again to the organisers for setting up this important event. Thanks to you for attending and thanks also to our team of interpreters uh, who are making this accessible for all. Over to you, Christina. Thanks so much, Hugh. It's great to hear about the UK's recognition, of long time recognition of local knowledge, support for the principles for locally led adaptation and, and your constant efforts to support 
more devolved and responsive finance for, for communities on the front lines of, of climate change. So really thank you for those, for sharing those thoughts and, and your comments. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Rebecca Shirley, who is the Director of Research, Data and Innovation um, at the World Resources Institute in Africa. Um, Shirley, I'm gonna pass the baton to you to continue the moderation of today's session. Glad, glad that you could make it, great to see you. Thank you, Christina, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for such an important event. Uh, my name is Rebecca Shirley, as Christina said, Director for Research Data and Innovation at WR Africa. Uh, I'm joining you actually from Nairobi, Kenya, and always half of my heart is at home in the Caribbean where I'm from, so I'm thrilled to be your moderator today for such an important dialogue. Um, Hugh, thank you so much for kicking us off. It was wonderful to see how much locally led adaptation is a priority for the upcoming COP. And I, as a researcher, really appreciated hearing about the capacity building and research being prioritized. Without further ado, I'm now pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Her Excellency, Ms. Diane Blackley. Diane is ambassador for climate change and director of the Department of Environment of Antigua and Barbuda. She's also the lead climate negotiator for the Alliance of Small Island Developing States. Diane, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Please, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Can this is sound chat? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So um, as the, uh, the negotiator for the chair of AOSIS, Antigua and Barbuda, um, want to make it very clear to everyone who's listening and everyone who is interested in locally led adaptation and with, as well as mitigation measures, that it is our view that there's no way that we can change what is happening now and, and, and shift without locally led um, action. And I'm gonna say something that's a little bit controversial and I ho hope Hugh can forgive me. Um, this is something, a prelude to what we're gonna say at COP, I guess, um, 26 is that 86% of the greenhouse gases, well over 80% of the greenhouse gases is coming from um, the fossil fuel industry. We're not, it's not just coal, it is diesel, LNG, and natural gas. And um, in terms of money going towards to, to damage the climate, they're getting over $600 billion per year. Money to help to fix the damage that they're causing that is directly, that we can count, that we can directly see that is ours and mostly grant is about $2.4 billion a year going to the UNFCCC fund. There's a lot of question in between how much it is and we fight over that at COP and we go back to the money that was sent to the World Bank and stuff like that, all of that is loans. But it was, it's very clear, we know how much money is going to the fossil fuel industry and most of that is grant, tax breaks and everything. So um, <clears throat> where do, locally led people fit into all of this is that you pretty much have $2.4 billion that is set aside by donor countries for 130 something countries to access. So it's really a small amount of money when it boils down per country and most of the, 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 the cost of adaptation by the state is so high, it really leaves very little room for, locally, for access to financing by locally led people. So there is an issue of scale of amount of money that is available. I wanted to tell you the funds for the, um, that is assigned to the fossil fuel industry. I want you to understand that because you can see there is more room for additional funding to be shifted to fixing the planet. Secondly, with access. Accessing money by um, fossil fuel in industry is much, 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 much easier than accessing by um, local, local sector. And um, one of the biggest risks that we all face, including my government, all the governments of AOSIS, in terms of Hugh and his team have been very great and they've come to us and said, you need to declare, and all the countries of the world have to declare what their ambitions would be, but there is a big problem with that. There's a huge political risk to governments declaring their ambition to cut back. Basically, if you say you're gonna have climate action, ambitious climate action, it predominantly means one thing, you're gonna cut back on your use of fossil fuel. The fossil fuel industry are rich, they have a lot of cash, a lot of subsidies for money they don't need, and they use it to fund political campaigns. And um, several times in the US, for example, and even in the UK, the UK government was one of the first to coin the $100 billion a year 
figure and the government of the day that came up with that figure and popularized that figure last election. In the US, a similar thing. So what we're seeing is that politicians is, have to uh, be careful how much they can say about what it is that they wanna do. How do you mitigate against that? You ask, and I'm glad that you asked, it is through local action. We have to tell people, this is climate change, we have to explain it to them, and then we have to give them the responsibility and the means and the tools and the information to execute that responsibility in a meaningful, functional way. So when a politician is saying, I have to cut emission, the locally led people would understand and can help him communicate that to local people. Local people are suffering, and then they go to the polls and vote against their own interests and they have no idea that they're doing this. Now, of course, we can't take money from the UNFCCC, the JAF, the, the GCF and so on and fund political campaigns. Then maybe there will be a fair fight, but we can't do that. Um, so locally led um, action can help a lot in the inertia in the system is because the, the, the risk to transition is so high, you're almost sure to lose your job if you're a politician. And this can help to mitigate that risk if we can get money directly to the local level and get it to them in a way that they can understand, get it in the design and implement and report on project in a way that is not onerous. Some of the data requirements that we have for these projects are too much. And so many local, Communities are like, you know what, I, I don't want to get access to that fund because it's just too much. And then if you don't, you cannot report on the funds in a way that we all would like, you know, like we all went to university, we all have a master's, not all of us, but some of us have master's, PhD. So we're expecting reports to look like that. These locally led people cannot do that. And we have not quite accepted that and quite adjust our expectation and the reporting requirement to that in, in many countries. We've seen a shift, but that is not occurring. So I just wanna to summarize today's, what AOSIS would like to see coming out of COP26, and we will be proposing this, is that we're going to ask you and his team to consider that instead of taking some of that 600 and something billion dollars that everybody G20, not just developed countries, developing country too, using um, for destroying the planet, is to shift just 1 billion, just 1 billion per year. Just 1 billion of that 680 billion, let's just shift 1 billion per year and provide that in a special fund for locally led action on, for climate change. Just 1 billion per year for NGOs and for community groups that have specialized access mod modalities, um, not quite like the, the Jeff Small Run program, but something similar. Um, but larger amount of money, the just small, small grants is just $50,000 and climate action is expensive. And so this is what we would like to propose as AOSIS coming into COP26. And it will be good if the UK government could um, see if that is something that they can, as a legacy coming out of all of their hard work to get all of us to come to, to COP, is to propose that this is something that we can we can have and so that we can empower people in the local level to not only take action, to also have a say, proper say, with enough information, in enough information on all of our decisions with respect to climate, both good Thank you, I'm done. <laughs> Diane, thank you so much for um, for your insightful remarks, and of course, as always, um, for being such a champion for locally led adaptation. I think right out the bat, you've taken us to the heart of the matter on the challenges for local adaptation. And yes, there are many challenges, uh, not least of which is that currently, as sort of as you're saying, less than ten percent of the international climate finance funds available are actually dedicated to local adaptation. And you beautifully explained how this finance gap, how this finance challenge is actually related to political and power dynamics, bringing the distributive and procedural justice implications right up to the fore. So thank you so much for that. And I think that your point is that in the midst of that challenge, there's actually ample room to put funds towards LLA. I jotted down your 
million, your billion dollars per year for LLA with specialized modalities. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of our audience is probably quickly jotting down their notes and, and nodding along with you as well. So thank you so much for, for kicking us off like that. Uh, now we have a quick menti poll to help us get to know each other a bit and to see who all is in the virtual room together. So I'm going to pass over to Marek Soans from IIED, who will guide us briefly through a few quick questions. Marek, are you there? I am. I think Christina is going to take my role on this. Okay, sure. Yeah, I was going to uh, take this over. Um, but Marek, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting onto the site. So if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen to pull that up, that would be really helpful. Um, I'll keep trying. But so we have this, this Menti po poll. What you need to do is to go to www.menti.com, ideally on your phone, but you can also open up another web browser and do it on your, on your computer and enter in the code 7576 space 9058. Uh, we have a series of questions just to get to know each other better, to get to know who's in this, this virtual room since we can't meet face to face. Um, and so we have a number of, of questions we'd like you to, to answer. You can just click through the questions. Um, and so just to kick us off, where are you connecting from? I've seen Trinidad and Tobago already in the room. Looks like we have Colombia, Barbados, Canada, St. Lucia. Um, Mexico, um, we hope you're doing well with the, the earthquake there, Costa Rica, um, Kenya as well, uh, very international crew that we have um, here today, so that's, that's great to see. Um, now we want to see in what sector are you working, um, you know, if you can define your sector uh, sometimes it's cross-cutting, but we see agriculture, climate finance, economic development, gender equality, so, so critical, uh, regional integration, um, gobierno, governance, uh, or government, more specifically, great, energy, um, great to see so many different sectors represented. Next, we want to hear what are the issues that you're working on. Um, again, this is a pretty cross-sectoral group, so I'm sure there's a, a variety. Of course, we have climate change and climate resilience, but also natural resources management, the public sector, mitigation, energy efficiency, um, money where it matters. I love that. Um, that's important. Finance, SDGs, great. We have a lot of different different issue areas represented here, um, but particularly climate finance, climate change resilience. Next, we wanna know if you've heard of the principles for locally led action. I see the results are, are still coming in. Uh, it's split about 50-50. So we have some people who, who know what these principles are that we're talking about and, and uh, maybe a slightly larger proportion who don't know what the principles of locally led action are. Well, don't worry about it because you will you will hear about those um, in great detail in, in just a little bit. So you'll, you'll leave understanding what those are. Next, we want to know your level of experience with locally led adaptation action. Um, and again, these are anonymous and everyone had to start somewhere. So, so don't feel bad if you feel that you're you're just here to learn. Um, and we do have many people in that category, which is, is great to see. Um, we also have some people who have a little bit of experience and some that have some experience and a small minority that have uh, a lot of experience, they would say, uh, with locally led action. That's great. It's, it's, you're all welcome here. We're, we're excited to have you here. No matter what your level of experience or familiarity is, your, your opinion matters to us. Um, Rebecca, I'm gonna turn it back to you so we can proceed with the program and, and learn a little bit more about locally led action. Wonderful. Thank you for that exercise, Christina. That was actually really fun. Um, it's great to see the diversity that's in the room. 
and it dawned on me that this means that there are many in the in the call themselves who were perhaps affected as tropical storm grace uh, swept through the northern caribbean last month my own family was or perhaps as ida lashed the eastern seaboard of the united states just last week or even as heavy rains battered the southern caribbean um, and trinidad and tobago in particular literally just a few nights ago um, and that exercise really reminded me that these are our homes, these are our families, these are our livelihoods and our communities. So again, adaptation at the local level, just so, so crucial. Um, wonderful. So next, that uh, brings us to our, our next speaker. Um, and to get us all onto the same page, we're going to have a brief introductory presentation of the principles of locally led adaptation from Eileen Marina Cunningham of CADPI, El Centro para la Autonomía de Desarrollo de los Pueblos Indígenas. So Elaine, over to you. Uh, hi, Rebecca. So it's Marek here. And unfortunately, uh, Eileen had to, at the very last minute, attend to a personal issue. So I'm going to step in at the very last minute for Eileen. Um, it's a real shame that Eileen can't be here to present this introduction on the global movement to local led adaptation. So hopefully, I can uh, do her introduction justice. Not a problem, Mark. Over to you. So it's a real pleasure um, to be here and speak after Hugh and Diane's fantastic intervention. So what I'm to, uh, going to give you today is a bit of an overview and a context setter on what is this movement behind local led adaptation, why are we so interested in supporting it, um, and an introduction to the eight principles which we've heard several speakers already introduce. So what are they? Why do they matter? And what is this, um, these dialogues all about that we're here to today? And many people from those polls are here to learn. That's fantastic to hear. So what is local led adaptation? So I'm sure you would all agree, um, or most of you will, I hope, that adaptation and building climate resilience really needs to focus on individuals, households at the local level and their local organizations that represent them. We would all agree that, that they're the focus of need to be the focus of building adaptation because they're the ones on the front lines of climate change right now. They're the ones dealing with most of the impacts. However, locally led adaptation is more than this. It's about actually giving these individuals, households, communities, local organizations at the front lines of climate change, more power and agency over their own adaptation to be able to prioritize, to design, to implement, to monitor and evaluate the successes and if their resilience is actually being improved and their livelihoods and their sustainable development is being benefited. And the important aspect is that we know that there are many local organizations and institutions that are there and able and committed to supporting local people um, to, be, to help facilitate their agency over their adaptation. Whether they be civil society organizations like community-based organizations and social movements that are able to represent excluded people, support investment in people-led solutions, or local government authorities and subnational governments that are responsible for meeting local needs and delivering public services and infrastructure if properly supported. And we have local enterprises in the private sector, both formal and informal, including financial institutions, cooperatives, even households themselves, that actually are the economic backbone of countries, both in developing and the developed world, that are the most important ones to support, not the corporations that um, Diane mentioned, the fossil fuel companies or the big corporations that are putting tax elsewhere, but these are the local enterprises that are really delivering uh, for the livelihoods of people within countries. Next slide, please, Ebony. Uh, and it is the fact that we haven't supported many of these local organizations and people at the front lines of climate change it's part of the reason that we haven't supported them that we're in this triple crisis, this climate, biodiversity and inequality crisis that we're facing now, because we haven't enabled equitable and inclusive decision making and rules across how we develop. Um, and, this, and this is despite the fact that households at the local level are already spending the most on adapting to climate change and responding to disasters. They're already spending most of their income when they have little income spare when most of that income is focused on delivering to immediate needs, yet they're having to spend the most on responding to these challenges. And this is despite the fact also that when we support local led adaptation, it can often be more uh, effective, more context specific, provide more agile and diverse solutions. We're supporting a much larger range of adaptation rather than a few solutions that might fail under different challenges. 
providing more innovation and more accountable and inclusive solutions when done so effectively. And it might not be that all adaptation needs to take place at the very local levels, but it's clear that we need to support more to take place at the local level and much more collaborative responses across levels of government and across the private civil society and government sectors. Yet too little climate development and humanitarian finance reaches the local levels. We heard earlier that less than 10% of global climate fund finance is dedicated to local actions. But we also have seen a continuing failure despite international commitments. For instance, the humanitarian grand bargain committed to get 25% of humanitarian finance to local responders, yet less than 2.5% is. We need to radically change this to shift and move away from this triple crisis. And the fact that we're not getting the finance at the local level is part of this business as usual system that we're operating in, where most adaptation finance is poor in quantity, as Diane introduced, but also poor in quality. It's often highly intermediated through a small array of international organizations that hold on to the knowledge or what's seen as knowledge, leading to top down designs away from local actors in distant headquarters. It doesn't build local capabilities that are essential to deliver transformative change to actually be there to help the sponsors and build long term resilience. It leads to short term projects and helicoptered in solutions that have a little focus on addressing the root and structural causes of vulnerability and a little focus on building long term climate risk management. We're seeing a wider range of evidence that's really showing that we think these actors have the knowledge on adaptation, these international organizations, but in reality, a lot of it isn't responding to these structural vulnerabilities and building resilience to the uncertain climate futures that we're facing. We need to give up more power. Next slide, please. Despite these challenges, we are seeing a, grow, a growing political movement on adaptation and local-led adaptation. We have, as introduced, the leadership from the world's least developed countries, that their least developed countries initiative for long-term adaptation and resilience that's committing to get 70% of climate finance to local adaptation by 2030. And we had the Global Commission on Adaptation, which is sunset, but had a local action track that with the being led by Commissioner Sheila Patel and Commissioner Dr. Mohamed Musa, that is putting the spotlight on the need for local led adaptation and getting more resources to the front lines of climate change. And more recently, we've had the COP26 presidency, Alok Sharma, stating that it's essential to support more local led adaptation. The G7 has welcomed the eight principles, which I'll go over in a second. And the Race to Resilience, the high level champions group, are trying to integrate local led adaptation across their initiatives. So, what are these eight principles? Next slide, please. So, the eight principles, these eight principles have been developed collaboratively with more than 50 organizations over the past few years and have built on a wide range of experiences and research across organizations like ourselves, IID, but organizations in the global south like Slum Dwellers International, the Faro Commission, and many others representing the poorest and most excluded. And they were launched at the Climate Adaptation Summit in January 2021 to really advance and guide what good adaptation practice looks like and to support more local-led adaptation. So this includes supporting devolving decision-making to the lowest appropriate level. So recognizing that we need to deliver more finance and support more decision-making led by local actors includes addressing the structural inequalities faced by women, youth, children, disabled, displaced, indigenous peoples, and marginalized ethnic groups, putting them at the center of adaptation decision-making, providing more patient and predictable funding. So the funding actually aligns with local needs, recognizing that transformative change takes decades, not a few years that most projects are designed around. We need to invest in local capabilities, leaving legacies of capable institutions that can facilitate adaptation effectively, not relying on international expertise. And building a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty that builds on local, traditional and generational knowledge, recognizing that they have been coping with uncertainty, providing solutions that work around their landscapes for generations. Also supporting flexible programming and learning, recognizing that adaptation is an inherent learning approach. If we think we have the solutions right from the beginning, we're widely mistaken. Adaptation needs to continuously learn, understand what new information is available, build from new solutions, learn from others, or recognize that climate change itself is an inherently uncertain process. And we need to align funding with this need for flexibility, promote small failures, recognizing this isn't contributing to the greater good of programming. And we need to ensure in transparency and accountability, allow local actors to see what adaptation is planned, 
allow it to see where decision making is able to be participated in. And we need more collaborative action and investment, collaboration across levels of government from the regional, national to the local level, and across whole of society, the private, civil society and government actors. We need to aim for as collaborative responses as possible, but supporting more local action in the process. Next slide, please, Evan. And we've had over 55 endorsements to these eight principles. This, this endorsing list isn't quite up to date. We've had more coming in recently. But this includes the UK government's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office. It includes international global climate funds like the Adaptation Fund and the Climate Investment Funds. We want to put pressure on the Green Climate Fund to join this list as well, so we can influence them. It includes uh, UN agencies like UNDP, but it also includes actors from the Global South. Um, we want to grow, including Canary, who you'll hear from today, Friendship from Bangladesh, but we want to really grow this list. We want you to join this journey with us, and we really would welcome you to get in touch with ourselves, IID and WRI, and the other partners who have endorsed in this list, if you would like to join us on this journey to collectively learn to deliver better adaptation that really works and empowers those at the front lines of climate change. Next slide, please. Edmund. So this dialogue that you're participating in today, we're going to hear from three fantastic examples. And you'll notice that some of these are also taking place, not just at the local level, but at the national level. And this is based on some of the work that we've been collectively doing on the concept of delivery mechanisms. Now, this isn't a new concept. We might have called it delivery mechanisms, but this is not new. This is recognizing that we do not need to invent, reinvent the wheel. We have institutions that exist in developing countries across the whole of society that are already capable of addressing the structural and root causes of vulnerability and have capabilities that can be maximized and can support the facilitation of effective adaptation and deliver adaptation finance to the local level. These exist across the government sector with the local government agencies or decentralization systems or social protection across civil society like local grassroots organizations supporting revolving funds or supporting women led organizations to facilitate the savings of local actors. They exist in the um, private sector, whether they be commercial banks providing commercial on lending and integrating climate change into those credit lines. They exist in bringing together local organizations, federating, building cooperatives to overcome the issue of aggregation and access and be able to negotiate better financial deals. It exists with microfinance, providing more appropriate finance to local organizations and enterprises. We have all of this knowledge that we need to uncover and connect that can facilitate finance to the local level. And crucially, we need to recognize that over 80% of the climate funding from the Green Climate Fund is currently going through international organizations. Yet we have all of these institutions within the countries and regions that we work, that we should be channeling this finance through. So this dialogue is really about uncovering them, hearing from a few examples and being able to replicate and scale them out. Ebony, next slide, please. So these dialogues, as I said, and this is the first Latin America and Caribbean dialogue. We've had the Africa dialogue on Monday and the Asia Pacific yesterday. Um, and we will have another set in October to really continue this discussion. But these dialogues supported by the COP26 presidency, the Adaptation Action Coalition and the Race to Resilience, alongside the 10 partners collectively working on it. As I said, are all about uncovering what approaches are available to facilitate, to govern, to finance local led adaptation, to support the scaling out replication of these approaches and really showcase to the international community that it's no longer acceptable to say that the capacity does not exist at the national and the local level, to say that it's too hard to finance local led adaptation because there are hundreds of approaches available that can deliver climate finance and other sources of finance effectively to the local level. And final slide, please. So what we've been doing with the partners across the last couple of months is to really start to try and map out, to put down on paper what all these approaches are. Now we've only uncovered a few, you'll see the Latin American regions, we need to start filling this gap from our own knowledge. And this is why we're running this dialogue to try and get your own knowledge and start filling this up to connect organizations together to really see, well, in this, let's say in, in a certain country, they're doing great things using their existing government systems. We really want to replicate that within our own country to create this knowledge, to create this portfolio of what's possible. We've already heard in Africa and Asia Pacific some inspiring examples ranging from adaptive decentralization in Kenya to social protection in India to small granting schemes in South Africa, in Namibia, in Micronesia. 
And today we're going to hear from three examples. I think I've got four there, but three. The Critical Ecosystems Partnership Fund across the Caribbean, Fundé Corporation from Costa Rica, and the Puanca Fund, which is a fund operating globally, but also in Latin America, supporting indigenous-led solutions. So I think that's the end of my introduction to this journey, global movement and local lead adaptation. But I really look forward to the three speakers we have and to the conversation that we're going to be able to take place. And I think as a little bit of time for some questions, if anyone would like to ask anything on the eight principles, on the movement and global lead adaptation, or anything else that is really essential to make this local lead adaptation journey a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marek, for that quick and clear synthesis of the principles and of the plan for this dialogue series. It looks like we may have lost Rebecca due to another power cut in Nairobi. Rebecca, are you there? Okay, um, I'll, I'll take over again for the interim until, until we can get Rebecca back. I wanna check and see if there's any questions. Oh, Rebecca, do we have you back? Okay, um, we'll, we'll carry on and hopefully Rebecca will be able to rejoin shortly. Um, I, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I want to see if there's any questions for, for Merrick in the interim. Um, see if anyone would like to put their hand up uh, or put a question into the chat function. Um, we can go to that. We also have another Menti exercise for, for everyone to, to crowdsource more expertise on locally led action. Uh. Is someone trying to come in? Please. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead and introduce yourself and, and, and ask your question. I'm a, I'm a uh, audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, greetings from India, Mysore. Uh, my simple question is uh, based on 1992 local agenda, which was very clear on embarking community enabling to care for its environment. You see, that has been the foundation. I had an opportunity to review a project for the Dutch embassy in India. And uh, we could notice multiple funding, you know, same project, three directions photos, and three donors identified. This is very shocking. But when you go to the locally led adaptation, I'm very happy because the indigenous knowledge, participation of the community in the process, and monitoring, everything is very well said. But there has to be an element of inbuilt mechanism so that the local you know, political dynamics is different totally. It mm -hmm. changes from countries to country. Absolutely. And in India, for example, I can tell you, we have wonderful legislations. You know, almost uh, reciprocating with the uh, unsaid 1992, we have 73rd and 74th Amendment. I'm closing now. Correct. We need to have, we need to have a mechanism so that uh, the local uh, political uh, influences are lived through. Mm -hmm. That is the uh, essence of my observation. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and it's great to have this opportunity to, to learn from the Indian experience with the constitutional amendment devolving certain issues to, to the ward level, to, to, uh, well, to the state level, and then to the local ward and district Correct. level. Um, however, there are still political influences at the local level that, that need to be navigated. Um, but there are best practices. For example, what is happening in Mumbai, Sheila Patel, there are some very good practices. Yeah, you have to, you have to catch that 
and, and take further because I'm a, I'm a reader of IAED Sage Publications. I can Great. make it. Uh, very well, good best practice. Yeah. Please do put the publications and the links in the chat box for everyone to have. It's great. Again, we want to cross fertilize across the regions. Different different places will have very different legal anyway, and. Uh, and my apologies for making working time, but no, it is that's great. Thank you. You're on mute, Christina. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for sharing that experience from. from in the India context. In the interest of time, I want to take us back to the Mentimeter, again, to crowdsource more of these experiences. Um, so if you wouldn't mind going back uh, to, the, to menti.com and entering 58816457, we have a couple more questions for you. And I think I can, uh, if we can share the, the Menti screen to see some of the answers coming in. So the first question is, what are some of the other delivery mechanisms that can channel finance to facilitate locally led adaptation? Um, so we've just heard an example from India where through the government system because of the constitutional reforms, channels funding down to the local level. What are some other mechanisms um, that, that are out there? Um, and unfortunately I can't share my screen. So I don't know, Merrick, if you could put the Menti screen back up. Um, so we could see the answers that are, are coming in. I know there's a few, um, a few answers. Great. So we see the Kenyan Devolved Climate Fund, great, an example from Kenya, uh, Red Plus mechanisms, the GCF Adaptation Fund, um, uh, Ocean Conservancy. It would be great to learn more about that. Uh, if, you, if you could put more information in the chat about that. Grassroots approach would seek to employ participatory approach, absolutely. National Forest Fire Protecting Program. That's another interesting one I, I don't know very much about, so it'd be great to get more information about that. Um, we're really keen to, to learn from the experience we know is out there, so, so please do share um, your thoughts on this. LDNF, range of alternatives, microfinance, CBF, e and, EBA, that's uh, environmentally based adaptation. Super. Now I want to go on to the, the next question that we want to crowdsource some information on. Um, and that's your thoughts on what could climate finance providers and big intermediaries do to deliver more climate finance to the local level? So what, what, what do we want climate finance providers to do? Um, Oh, great, some examples where there's already guidelines in UNCED, um, increased funds for local participation purposes. Great, because that, that participation needs to be supported. Um, patient funding, very much in line with the, the principles there. Work with local leaders and organizations, both the formal and the informal. That's, that's great, often the informal is, is is not done and harder to do. Um, make it easy to apply, not require audits. A lot of interesting ideas here. Um, great, great to see your, your thoughts. Please feel free to write your responses in, in your language. Uh, we can translate them and uh, we, we wanna hear everyone's thoughts here. Great to see these answers. We are going to collate them all and we'll share them with you and use them to inform our, our next dialogue series. So please do continue to share your thoughts on, on the Mentimeter. And I'm going to turn it um, back over to my colleague, Rebecca. It's great that the lights are back on where you are. <laughs> the, the, the power is really struggling and fighting with us uh, tonight, but we, we shall overcome. Um, so I'm back online and thank you. I saw all of those insights coming up. Great to see crowdsourcing at work. Um, and everyone, please do remember that the Menti link is live throughout the session. So please continue to share your ideas um, on, on both of those two questions, uh, even as, as, as the presentations are going on. We will check back in later with, um, with the Menti responses. Um, we're doing really well on time. So I am now pleased to introduce our first locally led adaptation case study presented by Mariana Lopez, who is Program Director at the Pawanka Fund. 
Mariana, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you to share a bit about Pawanka's approach to supporting locally led adaptation. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you, everybody, to invite Pawanka Fund to share our experience in this very important meeting. Uh, Pawanka Fund is an indigenous led fund. Uh, our mission is to change the way that uh, philanthropy is done traditionally. Pawanka is a mosquito name, uh, a word meaning something that is growing and strengthening. So all the pictures and images that I'm going to share are from our local partners in different parts of the, of the world. Uh, next, please. So the Pawanka Fund was created as a global indigenous-led fund in September of 2014 in the framework of the UN World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, and is led by indigenous leaders from different parts of the world, including North America, Latin America, Asia, Africa, Arctic, Pacific, and Russia. Pawanka Fund responds to the need of indigenous people based on relationship of trust networking and articulation between local and global processes. And the objective of Pawanka is to strengthen indigenous people's self-determined development through effective and strategic grant making. And the objective is to revitalize traditional knowledge and learning systems. Next, please. So this is just for, for you to have an idea of Pawanka fund uh, of these six years of, of life, uh, we have more than 300 local partners in uh, from almost 60 countries of the seven sociocultural region of the world. That means 261 grants and that reach 272 indigenous peoples in different region of the world. So in this image, you can see the names of the different indigenous peoples in different parts of the world. Next, please. So Pawanka funds work with a great diversity of partners. So we, uh, we are working with communities, with indigenous communities, but also with indigenous women organizations, elders or youth organizations, national, regional, uh, and global networks, indigenous with disabilities, territorial government, group of pastoralists, farmers, nomads, mountain people, Icelanders, fishmen, breeders, traditional healers, spiritual leaders, midwives, traditional authorities, judge. So this is to, to, to share that Pawanka Fan is working with local partners uh, in a very diverse way. Next, please. So Pawanka Fund is building a holistic, a holistic approach to grant making. So our model of grant making is based on different steps. So we have grant making, mentoring, learning, and sharing. These are our steps that we work in the grant making. We have different thematic cycles. Uh, our main issue is uh, uh, traditional knowledge revitalization. Uh, but we also have issued a specific emergency fund during the pandemic, and we still have that emergency fund. And we have special cycles on different teams. And one of our special cycle is uh, on building resilience, climate resilience. Because as all of you know, indigenous people are uh, the most affected people uh, on climate uh, change impacts. So uh, one of our special cycle is on climate resilience building and how the indigenous, the revitalization of indigenous uh, knowledge and value can really uh, be strengthened to face this climate um, change impact. So next, please. So our, our grant making uh, are direct support to community led organization and networks uh, we establish long-term partnership. Our grants range from $10,000 to $50,000 in a multi-year. 
we support the recovery and the revitalization, uh, revitalization of indigenous knowledge and practices. And the selection process is through cultural due diligence criteria. So the criteria to select the partners, Pawanka Fund use cultural criteria on, on that selection. Uh, that means uh, in indigenous partners that they are contributing to the well-being of their community or uh, the equity between men and women. So our guiding committee uh, de uh, defined eight cultural indicators that we use for the selection of our partners, but also in the monitoring and the follow-up of the implementation of the project. Yes, next please. So our programs of mentoring, learning, and sharing, uh, that means that we are not just doing a grant making, we are not just sharing finance support, we also accompany and support our partners in the design of the proposal. This is the, the mentoring role that Pawanka uh, has uh, in the implementation and all the process of monitoring and evaluation. We give technical assistance to our partners to fulfill the legal and administrative requirement. And also we promote exchange of knowledge and practices and peer-to-peer -peer capacity building process among our partners. We are building networks of solidarity and mutual support among our partners, and we are generating and disseminate uh, knowledge. Next, please. So Pawanka, uh, has a holistic approach to climate adaptation. Uh, in our grant making, we support more than 45 indigenous local community and organization in the seven sociocultural region that they are building collective resilience to face climate impact based on their traditional knowledge, applying a holistic approach and integrating innovation. So we are uh, promoting a learning process uh, between our partners that they are uh, building resilience to face climate impact. We implement a learning exchange. Uh, we have uh, so far seven regional meetings, uh, global climate resilience meeting, uh, where we could learn, um, of course, and, and, and share the different challenge and threats that our partners are sharing, but also how they are implementing solutions and strategies to face the climate impact. Next. So how does Pawanka support indigenous communities to build resilience and face climate impact? Well, first, recognizing the local expertise and knowledge of local communities. Making direct funding and partners have full control of the decisions of their projects. So we, are, we think that we support process and not projects uh, because our partners are implementing this process at the local level and we are facilitating resources to those process. Uh, being flexible on requirement and reporting system, selecting partner, uh, partners and promoting learning and sharing based on cultural criteria. Next. Establishing partnership based on trust and indigenous values, supporting self-determination and indigenous governance system. So Pawanka is supporting indigenous people own empowerment process. Uh, it's not Pawanka that empower indigenous people. We are facilitating and accompany indigenous people in their own empowerment processes. This is uh, a, a change in the paradigm of the grant making, where in many traditional mechanisms is the, the fund that empower or think that they can empower uh, their uh, partners or grantees. Uh, making efforts to reach indigenous community that otherwise would not have access to resources. So we uh, support the capacity building and the strengthening of the local organization and community to be able to access uh, funding. And we advocate for the transforming power relationship in philanthropy. So we work in many philanthropy networks uh, to try to uh, advocate for this uh, for 
increase uh, the power relationship and to have a more equitable uh, relationship between partners and funders. So next, I'm going to finish. Uh, we are going to share in the, in the chat a link with a very brief video where you can see uh, the experience of many of Pawanka partners uh, building collective resilience because indigenous people are building uh, resilience in a collective way. Uh, you will see um, experience from the pastoralists in, uh, in Tanzania and Kenya and how the movement is a key strategy to face the climate uh, change impact or, for example, in Rapa Nui, uh, the indigenous people uh, are building based on their traditional architecture and structures, are building um, structures to manage and keep the water, the rainwater. We have other experience in Colombia about agro schools or seed banks in Cambodia and Thailand or uh, in Russia, they are implementing uh, or are they are researching uh, geomagnetic energy and the link with uh, the climate prediction. Uh, or for example, in Alaska, they are developing, indigenous people are developing cultural mapping and they are linked this uh, process with the re recovery of the indigenous language. Uh, so please, if you, if you have time, uh, I invite you to, to watch the video to see uh, these different examples, uh, and also uh, what resilience means for indigenous people. We have shared with our partners, and uh, maybe they don't have a specific, um, a specific word meaning resilience, but resilience of indigenous peoples mean their self-governance, the strengthening of their self-governance system uh, means uh, water, land, natural resources, and of course, to have the strength to face the, cha the current challenge. Uh, so I, I want to, to finish here, and, and please, if you would like to make any question, uh, it's most of welcome. Wonderful, Mariana. Thank you so much for that um, for that presentation of uh, Pawanka's work. And uh, we will look forward to that video. In fact, one I was going to ask for if you could give us some examples of all of these amazing projects. And it was really great to hear that that long list that you just gave. Um, so thank you for that. We have time for just one or two quick questions for you, Mariana. So um, so here are a few um, that that we've sourced. Um, so given the wide experience, of course, you've just uh, clearly demonstrated on locally led adaptation, what would you say are the most critical challenges that you've come across in dealing with and supporting um, this wide variety of, of locally led adaptation initiatives? Yes, well, uh, the, the lo our local partners are uh, experiencing many, many challenge. Um, the most important challenge of indigenous people at local level is the extractivism uh, and the, of course the, the, the global warming uh, related to climate change. Uh, but the extractivism is the, uh, the extractive industry is one of the, the most uh, challenging issue of, the, of our local partners. And in our, um, in our view is of course very difficult to deal uh, with that, but uh, we can see how at local, at local level, our partners are implemented um, a holistic approach. And this is very important because if we analyze the process and the strategies implemented at local level, it's not just one strategy focuses in one issue, it's, uh, it's holistic. We, uh, the local partner are implemented strategies at maybe uh, regional level of advocacy at the same time that they are implemented very local local action. So this uh, range of strategies and um, a fund that are is flexible as Pawanka and we allow uh, our partners to really look uh, and, and to decide which of the, the, the different actions they think that is a priority. I think that this is for us a, a, a key to, 
to support uh, the, the action at, at a local level. Thank you, Mariana. Another question coming through from the audience is, is going back to the, the, um, the uh, selection process that you mentioned, and you mentioned the uh, cultural indicators for selecting partners uh, to deliver grants to. One of the questions coming through from the audience is if you could give us a bit more information on the concept of cultural due diligence and how it's applied through your grant making process. Yes, the, the cultural due diligence is the process of selection of our partners and is based on eight cultural indicators. Uh, I, I can share maybe my, my colleagues in the, in, the, in the meeting can share the eight cultural indicator in, in the chat so, so you can read them. Uh, these eight cultural indicators uh, were selected by our guiding committee members, these uh, leader, indigenous leader from different region because Pawanka has is very uh, we have a rich diversity because we are dealing with uh, with a very different context and background uh, but also we need some common element between the different uh, region and indigenous people so those eight uh, cultural criteria are common elements uh, priorities of indigenous people in the different regions. So the guiding committee uh, make collective decisions on the partners based on those indicators. So they uh, have to present and endorse a partner and they have to explain how this partner is aligned with these eight criteria, cultural criteria. So uh, later, the whole guiding committee uh, members in a, in a group, uh, they decide if this uh, partner is appropriate and they are aligned with our uh, cultural criteria. So this is the first step. After that, if this selection process go well and the partner was is selected, we have, you know, administrative and legal requirement, of course, because we are a legal entity and we need to fulfill a legal and administrative requirement. But it's not the first step of selection. And uh, when uh, the partner is selected, we support the process of uh, strengthening their organization to fulfill the legal and administrative requirement with the translation of material, for example, or even the certification of the organization. We accompany the partners to certify, to get their certification, to get their legal constitution of the organization. So this is like the, the, the second step. Uh, but in many cases, the, the selection of, of uh, partners uh, or grantees is based on technical criteria and the funds, they just review the proposals in a technical way. And in that case, uh, many of the funds go to NGOs, intermediate NGOs, and don't reach the indigenous communities or the indigenous uh, organization at local level. And that's why Pawanka wants to change that and is trying to build this process because it's not something that we we, we do the form the first uh, day we are building this cultural uh, criteria and cultural due diligence. Wonderful, Mariana. And just one final question for you um, to, to bring it back to the topic that Diana um, raised at the very beginning around financing. I'm wondering if you could say a bit about how global climate funds and donors might shift or, or better be able to support indigenous people specifically um, and get more finance behind their initiatives. Um, so if you were to give some guidance, for instance, to funders or, 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 the, or the donors seeking to replicate these kinds of approaches, what, 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 um, what advice would you give? Yes, uh, well, our first advice is to, uh, to base the relationship uh, on trust. So to start to build a relationship on trust with the indigenous communities and indigenous organization. And of course, uh, recognize the local knowledge uh, that the indigenous people in their uh, places uh, has, because uh, recognizing the, the knowledge is a way to change uh, the idea that the funders have the solution and uh, and the implementers they are just implementers. So in that way, to have a direct 
connection and a direct relationship uh, with indigenous communities and indigenous organizations is a way to change that and not to go through intermediate NGOs that maybe they have um, a technical expertise uh, uh, and they have experts uh, writing the report the report or writing the proposal, but maybe they don't have the knowledge uh, of the local problems and the possible solution at local level. So when we see indigenous people with their rich knowledge and uh, really uh, expertise at local level, it's a way to, to change that process. That's brilliant. I'm, I'm taking notes here. Um, Mariana, there's a number of questions for you in the chat. Clearly, people really appreciated your presentation. So I'll ask if you can answer some of those in text uh, in the chat while we move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Great. Excellent. Wonderful. So let's move swiftly along. Uh, thanks again, Mariana. And we'll, we'll now move into our next case study on the Critical Ecosystems Partnership Fund. This case study is going to be presented by Dr. Ayanka Grandison, who is the Senior Technical Officer at the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, or Canary. Ayanka, the floor is yours. Sorry, I just realized I'm muted. Unfortunately, my slide show seems to be um, not working properly, so I might ask Ebony, if she can share my slides instead. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so thanks for that introduction, Rebecca. Um, good day and greetings from sunny Trinidad. It's great to see such a fantastic turnout for this event. And I wanted to quickly recognize colleagues from the NDAs, accredited entities, and CSOs from across the CARICOM region that are part of the Caribbean Climate Finance Action Network that have joined us. Today, I'm excited to present on work that we're doing under the Caribbean program of the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, or CPF for short, which is a global initiative. This program provides an interesting model and food for thought, I think, and it is one of the ways that I see our organization, Canary, contributing to the principles of locally-led adaptation which we endorsed back in March. Next slide. So first, let me start with a quick overview. The CPF's Caribbean program has involved 10 years of investment, providing rapid and flexible financing to civil society to protect critical ecosystems and build resilience. Next, Ebony. It specifically targets civil society organizations, or CSOs for short, including national NGOs and community-based organizations that co-manage protected areas and conserve biodiversity and ecosystems, including groups led by and supporting women, youth, indigenous peoples, and other marginalized groups. Next, Canary serves as a regional implementation team overseeing the capacity building of the CSOs and also managing the small ground facility with the CPF secretariat um, being the one that has overall program implementation and managing the large grants with our support. So in its first phase from 2010 to 2016, there were 77 grants totaling 6.9 million US, which were provided that directly benefited 68 CSOs in the region and covered 32 key biodiversity hotspots across eight countries. <clears throat> In its second phase from 2021 oh, yeah. to 2026, that recently launched, the program is expected to provide grants totaling 11.8 million US to at least 60 CSOs and also cover 32 hotspots across eight countries. While the first phase did include a focus on climate change, ecosystem-based adaptation, is actually a key investment priority for phase two and is really central to this phase of work. So next, and then the next slide, thank you. So what is it? So this is just a quick snapshot actually of how CSOs were supported and the impact they achieved through the grants in phase one. 
And there's a lot to take in here, so I'm not actually going to go through this in detail. Next slide. So what is it that makes the CPS Caribbean program business unusual and a useful model to consider when we think about scaling up locally led adaptation? Firstly, there has been a transparent and participatory process for defining the investment priorities and strategy with, for example, over 94 organizations from civil society and the public and private sector engaged in developing the Caribbean ecosystem profile across the region to identify key areas for investment for phase two. This transparency also extends to the review and disbursement of grants overseen by a regional advisory committee and monitoring and evaluation, which is participatory and engages the grantees directly. Secondly, there is a strong focus on the organizational and technical capacity building of CSOs to enable collaborative management and leadership over the long term. Recognizing, as Marianne noted in the Kalanka Fund, that strong local organizations are needed to implement effective conservation and adaptation measures. Thirdly, it is a programmatic approach that provides flexible funding via small grants, 50,000 US and under, and large grants above 50,000 US, which we try to tailor to the needs of different CSOs. So many Caribbean CSOs are small in size and scope and really can't absorb more than small grants of 50,000 US. But there are also a number of higher capacity CSOs that can manage up to half a million or a million and we cater to this diversity as part of the program. The Caribbean program also uses a homegrown intermediary, Canary, which is a regional NGO that understands the national and regional context, has built trust, and we have well-established relationships with CSOs across the region and has a long-term presence and a commitment to capacity building and supporting conservation, adaptation, and resilience building. There is also a focus on improving the enabling conditions for conservation, ecosystem-based management, and resilience, including strengthening national policies and plans, convening roundtables with donors to improve coordination to meet investment priorities under the Caribbean ecosystem profile, and also fostering public-private civil society partnerships. Next slide. So in terms of how the CPF Caribbean program aligns with the eight principles for locally led adaptation that Marek um, highlighted and gave an overview of earlier, it actually aligns quite well with principles two, three, four, as well as six, seven, and eight as shown on the slide. However, in terms of principle one, much of the decision-making rests at the regional level with Canary and the regional advisory committee and so it's not necessarily devolved to the national or community level per se. Interestingly though, this does have benefits in terms of the economies of scale of having a regionally administered fund rather than many national funds or national intermediaries across the eight target countries. Also, while there has and will continue to be efforts to better understand climate change impacts and risks to guide the adaptation work, there has not been a significant focus on climate information services to inform decisions as outlined in principle five. Next slide. That said, the program has adopted a number of practices and leverage financing to support climate risk management and build resilience, including documenting and integrating local and indigenous knowledge and practices in assessing climate risks, vulnerabilities, and potential solutions designing and implementing ecosystem-based adaptation solutions with a focus on critical forests, mangroves, and coral reefs in the region that, import, that obviously provide important ecosystem goods and services for local livelihoods and communities. Next slide, it's also made streaming climate change and disaster risks into management plans, both at the site level, but also aligning with key national plans. And it also seeks to address gender inequality and other vulnerabilities through training CSOs, for example, in gender responsive approaches, environmental and social safeguards, as well as other tools. Next slide. So there has been an interesting journey from 2010 when the CEPF phase one in the Caribbean was launched to phase two, um, which just started this year. 
and the program has evolved through learning by doing. Next slide. So some of the key lessons that I wanted to highlight is firstly, the recognition of the need to invest the time and resources to effectively address the capacity gaps of civil society organizations and be responsive to their needs in order to truly realize the capacity building outcomes of the program. This was something that was underestimated in the first phase and there's actually much more funding that's going towards the capacity building program in this phase two. Also, I think it's important to note that with the grant funding, even though it seems like small amounts, CSOs were actually able to pilot quite innovative actions and have real impact on the ground, including developing the Caribbean's first forest carbon offset program and payments for ecosystem services for sustainable financing in the Dominican Republic under phase one. Next slide. So with the success of phase one and the now proven track record of the target CSOs, the CPF funders have actually doubled the commitment and investment for phase two, recognizing the need and potential in the region, which is exciting. However, there have been some key challenges and setbacks that are worth noting and will need to be addressed as we move forward. So this includes the fact that it actually took a lot of time to set up and launch a phase two, with a five-year gap between phases that was not actually planned. It was supposed to be much shorter than that. And this is in fact, I think, disrupted some of the activities of the CSOs that have been expecting the phase two. It's also increased threats to biodiversity and local livelihoods due to the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic that would not have been factored into the original um, ecosystem profile and investment strategy when it was developed in 2017 to 2018. And so those issues I think will need to be addressed. And there's already some anecdotal evidence that you know, with people losing their jobs and their livelihoods under threat, there is heavier natural resource use and exploitation. And then we'll have to look at how we're kind of addressing that threat. And then obviously there's also the long-term sustainability post-investment um, that we have to consider, you know, once this investment phase is done in 2026, how do we move beyond this and continue to provide this type of support? So I think with that, um, I'll end here um, as I think my eight minutes <laughs> um, is probably up. So thanks very much. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, please check out the program webpage, which is listed on the slide. I can also put it in the chat and also feel free to contact me or my colleagues via email. Um, so with that, I'll hand back over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Anka. That was a really exciting presentation. Um, and great to see um, you. you uh, I hope that these slides will be shared so that we can go back and pull over that, that, that one slide that you had with all of the exciting impacts that you're actually already beginning to see from this work. So again, similarly, we'll just ask one or two questions to you that are coming through from the audience. Um, one question you mentioned, uh, and it's great to see that we actually can see a proven track record here as, as the CEPF program has been running for, for some 10 years now. Can you share a bit on mechanisms that you suggest from your, your work with the CEPF and all of these amazing um, initiatives for tracking progress or monitoring progress over the long term? So, yes, I think they're actually at the moment developing the new monitoring and evaluation plan with key indicators and targets. But for phase one, based on the, the ecosystem profile that was developed back in 2010 to guide that first phase of investment from 2011 to 2016, they would have had very clear indicators and targets so that they generally three or four strategic directions, um, which focus on things related to biodiversity and ecosystem services, um, looking at landscape level change and promoting corridors to actually allow for an ecosystem sort of based management uh, indicators around sustainable livelihoods, because one of the key things on the CPF is nature for people and not nature or people. And so trying to really focus on enhancing sustainable and resilient livelihoods based on the natural resources and the services that are provided within these areas. 
Um, and then also there's a target around partnership building um, to really strengthen the work and the collaboration between civil society and other key partners in government and private sector. And so all of that's generally outlined in the profile and then used to then guide the development of a very clear sort of monitoring evaluation plan with very specific targets and indicators. Um, and that is developed in a consultative process. As I mentioned, there were a lot of stakeholders involved in developing the profile. And so it's highly consultative and that then guides the work that Canary is the regional implementation team, as well as the regional advisory committee, which I should have said is made up of national and other representatives from all of the target countries, as well as experts um, who provide, you know, obvious resources and services for the review and oversight of the, of the fund. Um, and that all helps with the monitoring and evaluation. Um, and so, I mean, I can always find out more from the actual project manager, because I'm not the project manager for this, to kind of answer that question around monitoring and evaluation. But we really look at doing a sort of participatory process for that. Um, and that also builds in learning and adaptive management so that we really document and track what is working and what's not to really inform us as we move along. Wonderful. Um, two more quick questions. Now, you mentioned the idea of homegrown intermediaries, which is quite interesting. Can you share some advice for how this model could be leveraged, replicated in other contexts to support LLE? Uh, certainly. So, I mean, one thing that we have kind of been looking at through another sort of GCF actually readiness project that we're working on with several NGs in the CARICOM region is also thinking about, you know, where are there um, civil society organizations, particularly at the national level, that can serve that role potentially as intermediaries or implementing partners for work? And so, for example, in the work that we do, there are a number of national trusts, for example, because we work a lot on sort of conservation and there are con national trusts in many of the islands in the Caribbean that are very strong and actually have very clear procurement processes, have managed you know, grants up to a million US or more. And so they're very well placed, I think, to be able to serve that role of sort of a homegrown local intermediary. And so it's not that Canary alone is one of the only CSO that has that capacity. I think there are many others. And it's something for us to really consider when we're looking at potential intermediaries and implementing or delivery partners for work under GCF, Adaptation Fund, et cetera, that we look at some of those organizations as potential partners. Excellent. It would be great to say, I, I, I love that. And if there was even sort of a, I'm sure there must be some sort of um, uh, mapping of all of those uh, CSOs that can that can really fit um, into that level as as intermediaries, um, and then of course the last question that I want to ask Inka just very quickly is as I as I asked to Mariana as well as your 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 thoughts on finance and how might some global climate funds need to change their access criteria to allow funding to flow to many of the CSOs that you're supporting in the Caribbean. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the, I guess, billion dollar question. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think, you know, many people have highlighted the sort of onerous application sort of processes and the time and all of the hoops and requirements that you have to jump through. And I think the shift that we're seeing with a number of the bigger funds, like the Adaptation Fund and the Green Climate Fund, looking at how they can set up what they're calling enhanced direct access mechanisms, which are really um, on granting mechanisms that allow um, regional or national entities within the countries to really sort of create a sort of tailored facility that allows for you know, this sort of small, medium, large grants to be given out that really match the capacities of different CSOs in the region and allows them to get funds through a more simplified process because obviously a small grant, you know, for a million dollars, you're not going to require people to go through the same very detailed sort of um, application process and requirements, although obviously you still have to do your due diligence as Mariana very nicely outlined what they do for Planca Fund and ensure that that money is being used effectively. But I think it's also important 
um, and thinking about that financing. And I think this is where the CEPF model is quite interesting, is to also remember that along with the financing, we need to have that capacity building support because we can't just assume that all these entities are ready to just kind of roll out some of these funds. I think we need to really support them through learning by doing as they're actually ruling out some of these grants to do that effectively and actually build up their processes so they can actually go on to doing larger grants you know, over time and really scale up the kind of financing and work that they can do. And I think that will have real impact as we move forward. Great. So meeting meeting CSOs where they are matching their capacities and also um, not overlooking the need for, for for capacity building alongside um, alongside finance. Um, great, uh, Ainka. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, uh, we're going to move on now to our third and final case study from Funde Cooperacion. And we're going to have uh, Carolina Reyes, who's the head of project development or project department, sorry, at Funde Cooperacion. Carolina, thank you for being here to share your experience on locally led adaptation. Folks, kindly note that Carolina will be presenting in Spanish. So for all of our English speakers, you're invited to select interpretation at the bottom of your, of your window to hear a translation of her presentation to English. Carolina, the floor is yours. Perfect. Uh, I hope you can see my my pre my presentation. And yes, as you mentioned, I will present it in Spanish. So, although I can, uh, in the question uh, part, I can answer in English. So, um, just just in case. Bueno, muchísimas gracias por por la invitación realmente a a presentar nuestro nuestro caso, verdad? Y básicamente eh, Ha sido realmente muy provechoso las, las diferentes presentaciones y, y realmente nos permite compartir y aprender de otros colegas que están haciendo o que están trabajando en, en ese empoderamiento local eh, en temas de adaptación. Un poco de, de lo que somos, que es Fondo de Cooperación para el Desarrollo Sostenible. Somos una organización privada, una fundación privada en Costa Rica que trabaja Eh, en colaboración con todos los sectores realmente de la sociedad eh, civil. Nacimos en 1994 y como una organización sin fines de lucro y estamos representadas, como les dije, por, todo, por todos los sectores, sociedad civil, sector privado, academia, gobierno, eh, etc. Y nuestro trabajo es, nuestro enfoque es transformar y promover el desarrollo sostenible mediante eh, acceso a financiamiento y, y, y permitir que estas pequeñas y medianas empresas y comunidades, organizaciones locales eh, puedan accesar a financiamiento para promover desarrollo sostenible y, y también pues acciones climáticas a nivel nacional. Nuestro enfoque sobre todo va a esas organizaciones que no tienen acceso a banca tradicional, por ejemplo, y a partir de eso pues generar capacidades y generar impacto eh, en el país. ¿Cómo lo hacemos? Tenemos dos, dos formas de trabajo y, y, y ese, ese, esa imagen representa mucho de lo que hacemos. Tenemos por un lado... Eh, La parte de crédito, tenemos, somos una microfinanciera que permite y apoya el acceso a financiamiento a aquellas organizaciones que no tienen acceso a banca tradicional y a partir de eso apoyarlas a generar eh, transformaciones a nivel local. Y entonces con esto hemos apoyado más de 400, bueno, mucho más eh, organizaciones a nivel local para generar transformación en el sector agropecuario, el sector turístico eh, y muchos otros sectores a nivel nacional fomentando eh, acciones climáticas y desarrollo sostenible. Pero también tenemos otro, otro brazo de acción que es cooperación internacional, que es eh, mediante fondos, lo que llamamos fondos no reembolsables, que lo que buscamos es a partir de proyectos eh, de cooperación poder validar 
muchas de las, de, las, de las acciones que tenemos que llevar adelante como país y poder eh, de forma conjunta, tanto con, por un lado en la parte de proyectos, pero eh, escalar y replicar esas acciones ya después por medio de, de financiamiento por medio de microfinanzas. Entonces, esa conexión entre la parte de cooperación y la parte de microfinanzas en nuestra organización es fundamental, porque como mencionaban las colegas anteriores, el tema de generación de capacidades, el tema de validación de acciones, eh, es, 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 un, es realmente un punto importante que nos permite eh, aumentar impacto. Entonces, a partir de eso... Eh, la organización ha permitido, ha, ha tenido la posibilidad de eh, trabajar en básicamente todo el país. Por el lado de, de microfinanzas, indicar que hemos creado varias líneas de, de financiamiento que van atendiendo a las diferentes necesidades y eso lo vamos a ver que es importante, que es muy importante para los ocho principios que, que estábamos hablando. Específicamente en la parte de cooperación internacional y uno de los, de los proyectos eh, estrella en ese potenciar el liderazgo a nivel local, eh, tenemos un financiamiento del Fondo de Adaptación. Nosotros somos el ente implementador nacional del Fondo de Adaptación en Costa Rica y tenemos un proyecto de 10 millones de dólares que busca atender y apoyar el sector agropecuario, recurso hídrico y zona costera en la adaptación. Eh, a partir de esto, pues hemos tenido la posibilidad de, o se, eh, como país se decidió que el acceso a este programa y el acceso a los recursos se hiciera de una forma eh, abierta. Eh, para ello se hizo una convocatoria abierta de proyectos, de propuestas, y a partir de eso tenemos más de 40 entes ejecutores nacionales que van desde lo local hasta incluso lo nacional. Y a partir de eso hemos tenido la posibilidad de construir en ese empoderamiento eh, de las organizaciones para accesar a financiamiento climático. Eso es un poco el resumen del impacto que estamos teniendo con el programa. Y como les decía, eh, al, al final... Eh, Atendemos tres sectores, el sector agropecuario, recurso hídrico y zona costera, pero hay un tercer componente eh, que es el de creación de capacidades. Y esa creación de capacidades ha sido fundamental para generar un impacto y sostenibilidad de, los, de las iniciativas o del programa a nivel nacional. El enfoque en los, ocho, en los ocho principios y un poco entendiendo lo que hacemos como Fund de Cooperación, eh, realmente a nivel de organización, cómo devolvemos esa toma de decisiones ¿verdad? Al, al, nivel, al nivel local. Eh, básicamente lo hacemos de diferentes formas, como vimos el programa Adaptados tiene estos subproyectos de más de 40 entes ejecutores y ahí como les decía tenemos representación desde asociaciones de productores hasta centros agrícolas cantonales, tenemos eh, Básicamente la posibilidad de que las comunidades, las personas productoras tomen la decisión y, pla y no solo les permite planear, sino implementar acciones de adaptación a nivel local, pero también paralelamente generamos ese acceso a financiamiento. El tema microfinanciero para nosotros es importantísimo porque a pesar de que tenemos un proyecto, un programa, eh, lo, lo importante es también generar capacidades para manejar financiamiento climático que me permita seguir avanzando en medidas de adaptación y en, media, y en soluciones. A partir de eso, este otro brazo de microfinanzas eh, ha permitido generar impacto en organizaciones locales eh, y sobre todo muchos de ellos inician eh, no teniendo acceso a banca tradicional, pero el crecimiento que se genera durante varios años de apoyo por parte de nuestra organización, incluso hacen que tengan en algún momento acceso a, a banca tradicional, pero parte de eso es la importancia de ese acompañamiento, de esa creación de capacidades y de ese realmente acceso a, a recursos. A partir de eso también, este, bueno, el, el segundo principio nos habla de toda la parte de cómo a nivel de estructura logramos tener o enfrentamos aspectos como inequidades, ¿verdad?, de jóvenes, mujeres, niños, 
pues básicamente a nivel de organización hemos llevado adelante políticas eh, como organización hemos llevado adelante políticas como la política social, ambiental y de género, también eh, políticas como cero tolerancia al fraude, eh, toda la parte de, de eh, que nos permite cumplir con los requisitos fiduciarios de organismos internacionales para poder accesar a financiamiento. Y esto es algo que transmitimos a los diferentes entes ejecutores y a las diferentes organizaciones que trabajamos. Fortalecer, eh, fortalecer esos requerimientos es importante no solo para nosotros como organización, como fondo de cooperación, sino con los diferentes aliados con los que trabajamos para poder eh, validar y garantizar eh, eh, la reducción de posibles ine eh, inequidades que se implementen con los proyectos, pero también evitarlas, prevenirlas y también eh, eh, implementar acciones de mejora. Como organización les decía que también pues desde nuestro core business, decirlo, por decirlo así, promovemos o fomentamos o buscamos eliminar ese tipo de, de aspectos y, y por ejemplo parte de las diferentes líneas de crédito de acceso a financiamiento, hemos generado eh, una línea de crédito directa para eh, mujeres identificada después de, eh, o sea, una vez que identificamos esto como una barrera, evidentemente para nuestra organización es importante atenderla y, y dar soluciones. Entonces, a partir de eso, eh, hemos podido crear diferentes líneas de financiamiento ajustadas y adaptadas a las necesidades, al contexto de las comunidades, que es lo más importante. Y luego también toda la parte de esa generación de capacidades que nos ha permitido llevar de la mano a las mujeres, jóvenes y demás eh, o poblaciones indígenas a eh, li liderar sus, sus procesos de adaptación y sus procesos de acción climática. Eh, toda la parte de financiamiento, pues evidentemente, eh, como les mencionaba, nuestras líneas de, de financiamiento son bastante adaptadas a los contextos nacionales, y a los contextos locales y como y incluso en muchos de los casos, por ejemplo, en el sector agropecuario están ajustadas a, los, a, las, a las necesidades por cultivo, por ejemplo, y eso nos ha permitido, esa flexibilidad es eh, necesaria con el, con el interés de atender ¿verdad? Eh, varias de las barreras que muchas veces se encuentran para accesar a financiamiento. A partir de eso, eh, no solamente hemos creado, como les dije, la línea de crédito para mujeres, eh, para mujeres, eh, mujeres natura, sino también eh, generamos líneas de financiamiento climático como ganadería proclima y agricultura proclima que van específicamente a atender eh, o a promover medidas de adaptación. A partir de eso, pues este, este tipo de financiamiento pues, se adapta a las necesidades, desde tenemos un máximo de 10 años de financiamiento, de 10 años cuando estamos hablando de crédito, 10 años eh, eh, hasta 10 años, sin embargo eso evidentemente varía y el acompañamiento técnico y el seguimiento técnico para, eh, para accesar a este tipo de financiamiento es importante, sobre todo porque eh, queremos llevar a buen término este tipo de proyectos. La, la la, la generación de, de, bueno, el seguimiento, monitoreo y acompañamiento técnico lo da la, la organización de cooperación y evidentemente el, la posibilidad de trabajar con organizaciones aliadas que potencien eh, los resultados es importantísimo para nosotros. Eh, bueno, ya he hablado eh, sobre todo de, del tema de, de, de invertir local en, en capacidades, esa conexión entre la parte de proyectos y en la parte de, de microfinanzas es importantísima para poder potenciar eh, acciones y, y escalar. Evidentemente, eh, trabajar con 40 organizaciones de diferentes niveles es todo un reto como, como organización, pero eso también nos ha permitido identificar cuáles necesidades según los sectores o según el tipo de organización son necesarias eh, para, para poder generar mayores, mayores impactos. Un momento. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo trabajamos el tema, el tema de, de, de adaptación? Y al final, específicamente, eh, con las diferentes organizaciones, ellas 
son las que realmente identifican las necesidades, pero el tema, eh, el tema de toma de decisiones y el tema de planificación de las diferentes acciones climáticas van de la mano de expertos eh, que, que buscamos sea, sea un, una forma de unir esfuerzos y realmente eh, generar buena adaptación. A partir de eso, por ejemplo, hemos, es, hemos tenido la posibilidad de transformar eh, información climática que se traduzca en el lenguaje, por ejemplo, de personas productoras para que estos puedan hacer una toma de decisiones mucho más adecuada eh, de lo que deben hacer. Y esa conexión entre expertos y comunidad ha sido fundamental. A partir de eso hemos podido generar eh, no solamente planes de acción a nivel local, sino también hemos podido generar casos de estudio y al final ese, ese tema de pilotaje, ese tema de, de fincas escuela, fincas modelo o incluso comunidades modelo que puedan, que puedan compartir en, en, de tú a tú con otras comunidades o con otras eh, personas productoras, por ejemplo, eh, ha sido uno de los, de los, de los eh, aspectos eh, importantes, ¿verdad?, que, nos, que, que hemos tratado de promover. Evidentemente, las condiciones del clima son totalmente eh, inciertas, ¿verdad? Eh, sin embargo, eh, el apoyo local y ese, y ese empoderamiento local nos ha permitido eh, ir generando o ir eliminando ciertas barreras en, en el tema de toma de decisiones. ¿Cómo hemos hecho ese Enhanced Direct Access que mencionó a Inca, que es un poco como le dice el fondo de adaptación? Eh, hemos, hemos atendido mucho de esto a través de eh, aprendizaje de, de co tipo Cooperación Sur-Sur, entendiendo Cooperación Sur-Sur más a lo local entre comunidad A y comunidad B, y ese intercambio de experiencias que empodera a los beneficiarios y si le permite desarrollar soluciones basadas, bueno, en el conocimiento de que, mira, aquella persona lo hizo así, debería yo hacerlo así, te recomiendo hacerlo de, otra, eh, de esta manera, donde los, la, las personas eh, expertas son parte, mas no lideran ese intercambio, sino que lo, se permite hacer de igual, de, de igual a igual. A partir de eso hemos tenido o hemos aprendido con las diferentes organizaciones que trabajamos y a, y a, y a partir de eso hemos tenido, que ser basa, eh, hemos tenido que ser hasta cierta forma flexibles sin comprometer eh, calidad o sin comprometer eh, eh, cumplimiento, ¿verdad? Entonces a partir de eso para nosotros ha sido necesario eh, entender contextos, entender vulnerabilidades, entender con, condiciones socioeconómicas que nos permitan un poco a, a adaptar eh, la programación y el aprendizaje, pero también nos permita a partir de eso fortalecer las, las instituciones o las organizaciones para llevar a cierto, a cierto nivel. Y obviamente a nivel de financiamiento climático, a nivel de microfinanzas, esto, esto ha sido fundamental eh, para poder eh, potenciar acceso a, a crédito y que sean proyectos sostenibles y realmente financieramente viables. Eh, a nivel de transparencia y accountability, como se le dice al, al, set, al, minute, Carolina, sí, Thank al you. séptimo principio, hemos eh, incluido un código de ética, una política social ambiental, una, una política de género, hemos eh, puesto en, en en funcionamiento un sistema robusto de monitoreo, de, eh, de procedimientos de compras, de evaluación de riesgos eh, que cumplen con los requerimientos nacionales e internacionales y esto ha sido traducido también a las organizaciones locales y el acompañamiento a eso ha sido importante. Eh, eh, conforme al octavo principio, básicamente decirles que nuestra organización trabaja con más de, 500, más de 100 organizaciones solamente en el programa Adaptados, pero si ponemos, po, podamos, podemos contabilizar nuestro trabajo en alianzas, eh, pues es impresionante. Tenemos alianzas en todo el país 
Y esto ha sido importante porque nos permite construir puentes entre, por ejemplo, emprendedores y recursos de financiamiento. Eh, y también nos permite evidenciar el trabajo que está haciendo el país a nivel nacional. Con solo decirles que el fondo de adaptación es un fondo de 10 millones de dólares y la contrapartida, es decir, el trabajo de las organizaciones a nivel local en temas de adaptación han sumado más de 6 millones de dólares eh, en, en este trabajo. Y eso no lo hacemos solo Funde Cooperación, eso lo hacemos de una forma colaborativa eh, que nos permita evidentemente accesar a más recursos, pero también eh, evidenciar el esfuerzo de, de todas las organizaciones desde lo, lo local hasta lo nacional. Y eso sería de mi parte. Muchísimas gracias y cualquier consulta, mi correo y, y mis contactos y los invito a visitar nuestra página de Fondo de Cooperación. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Carolina. That was really excellent to see um, the explicit mechanisms you have for supporting gender equality and transparency and accountability. We've got one quick question for you coming through from the chat um, from audience member wondering, given your design and the challenges that you've raised in your presentation, um, if you see any way that the inclusivity of decision making on grants could be improved. Can you repeat? Sorry. Yes. Yes. If given if given what you what you've outlined as the, the design for for um, Funde Cooperación, if there are ways to improve the inclusiveness of the decision making process on how grants are distributed. Um. Yes. Uh. Well. In in the in. Maybe in Spanish. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sí, básicamente, pues eh, realmente hemos tenido un, una gran fortaleza en, 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 o una gran, gran oportunidad en la, en la parte de brindar los diferentes financiamientos, eh, sobre todo, por ejemplo, con el programa Adaptados. La inclusividad ha estado presente. Les decía que tenemos básicamente representación de los diferentes sectores, de los cinco sectores, desde el sector privado a organizaciones locales, no gubernamentales, gobierno y demás. Y esto nos ha permitido evidenciar también eh, una participación activa de los diferentes sectores en, en temas climáticos y las necesidades. Sí hay mucho que mejorar y creo que la, el, la, el aprendizaje que hemos tenido del programa nos permitirá hacer eso en, futuras, en, futuras, en, en futuros financiamientos, pero creo que el tema de haber hecho una llamada, una convocatoria abierta de participación fue un, un aspecto clave para realmente tener una representación eh, certera y buena de los diferentes sectores y de las diferentes organizaciones. Eh, a nivel de financiamiento, a nivel de microfinanzas, eh, hemos tratado de ser bastante eh, a la medida. Hemos tratado de ser bastante a la medida y ese a la medida ha implicado realmente adaptarnos, ser resilientes, eh, eh, adaptarnos realmente bastante a las necesidades de las organizaciones locales y creo que a partir de eso es lo que ese, ese, esa adaptabilidad ha permitido a muchas organizaciones tener el acceso a financiamiento que tal vez en otras organizaciones o en banca tradicional lo han tenido. Seguimos creciendo y se, o sea, seguimos eh, constantemente viendo dónde mejorar eh, sin embargo, sí tenemos que cumplir y saber que el, el acceso a financiamiento tiene que ser a, adaptable, pero también tiene que ser eh, efectivo en el sentido de que las organizaciones puedan cumplir, eh, sobre todo en tema de microfinanzas, con el compromiso, eh, el compromiso adquirido. Entonces es un poco de equilibrio entre las dos, pero evidentemente sí hay, hay cosas que podemos ir haciendo y nos estamos constantemente creando nuevas ideas de acceso. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina, for those insights. Um, I think you can see 
uh, through the through these three presentations, the clear trend is models that match the capacities of local CSOs. Um, from a financing point of view, come downwards. We had Mariana talking about the need to allow CSOs to access funds in a more simplified process. That could mean, um, you know, prioritizing due diligence. And Mariana showed how due diligence can be expanded to be culturally appropriate for local contexts. Um, she also mentioned the need to minimize as far as possible the the um, uh, the number of intermediaries that are involved, and that took us directly into Anka's conversation about homegrown intermediaries that can fit the bill. Um, she talked about national trusts that, um, for instance, have clear procurement processes um, and have track records managing big grants that can prioritize um, that can be prioritized uh, for working and 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 being the middlemen. Um, to for for finance distribution um, and and also she talked about the need to prioritize and not overlook um, the important challenge of capacity development we heard about how monitoring evaluation and learning processes are also being adapted for the local context and surely i'd love to unpack that a bit more because surely there must be lessons here that are transferable to other regions and then and that's also where carolina picked up carolina was also talking about very explicit mechanisms that they've put in place at Funde Cooperacion to support and ensure transparency and accountability, and importantly, um, address uh, gender equality. So thank you so much to all of the speakers. I think we've got some wonderful insights here. Um, this has been such a rich and crucial discussion on LLA and how we can make sure that local communities and partners on the front lines of climate impacts have access to finance that they need, the decision-making power that they need to invest their own adaptation priorities um, and build their own resilience. So thank you to our speakers, Mariana, Carolina, Ainka, and of course, thank you to the interpreters who have been very hard at work um, on the call and in the chat. So folks, the, our time is up for today, um, but the conversation is certainly going to continue. We hope that you can join us for our next dialogue uh, where in October, where we will have the opportunity to drill even deeper into what's needed and what we can do together to scale up finance and support for locally led adaptation. We have one last Menti poll um, that I think is going to go up quickly, um, which, you can, which we invite you to complete. Um, would Christina or Merrick like to? Yes, there it is. <clears throat> you can see the slides. So just take yourself over <clears throat> to the Menti code with the Menti code or to menti.com or use the scanner um, to, to answer that last question, which is about continuing to engage in the regional dialogue series on scaling up locally led adaptation. While you're all answering that question, I just want to echo a comment that was made by Marek earlier in the conversation. Um, we do hope that your institutions will consider endorsing the principles for locally led adaptation. If you've not done so already, please join us in this movement. Anyone can sign on. And we recognize that the journey to supporting locally led adaptation looks different depending on who you are as a, stake, as a stakeholder. So my colleagues will include more information in the chat box um, and, and later on for those who are ready to, to explore what it would mean to endorse the principles. With that, let me just say thank you again to our speakers. Thank you to our interpreters. Um, thank you to everyone who is working behind the scenes um, from, the, from WRI, from IIED, and from all of our partners. Um, we, we wish you a safe day, a safe evening, if it's like me and you're, it's, it's rounding out to, 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 to late night. Um, and we do hope that you will continue to, to, to engage with us on this journey and participate in our next dialogue. With that, I'm going to, to close the session and um, everyone take care and we will be in touch with more information. Thank you so much for joining. Take care.